the last episode on the Neo-Sumerian Empire, we saw that after the years of chaos that followed the demise of the Akkadian Empire, a king named Ur-Nammu came to power and stabilized, as well as revitalized, much of southern Mesopotamia. After centuries of foreign domination, first by the Akkadians under Sargon the Great and his descendants, and later by a mountain people known as the Gutians, Ur-Nammu formed a kingdom that would rapidly grow to become the Neo-Sumerian Empire. Scholars call the dynasty that he founded the Third Dynasty of Ur, abbreviated as Ur III. Of course, Ur-Nammu's kingdom wasn't without enemies. The Gutians were still a threat. In fact, it's in battle with the Gutians that Ur-Nammu met his end in the year 2095 BCE. However, his son and successor Shulgi kept up the fight and eventually defeated the Gutians, sending them back to their stronghold in the Zagros Mountains for good. After this, he became the second king of the third dynasty of Ur, and it's under him that what we call today the Neo-Sumerian Empire really took shape. Shulgi is often viewed as one of the most enlightened kings of the ancient world. During his extremely long reign of 47 years, Shulgi continued the political expansion and cultural renaissance that were the hallmarks of his father's reign. Shulgi must have been quite young when Ur-Nammu was killed in 2095 BCE. From one of the royal Sumerian epics that have been uncovered, we learn that just before his coronation, Shulgi had gone to war against the Gutians to avenge his father's death. His victory in battle helped to both solidify his succession, as well as to give him the reputation of being a powerful warrior. During the years of Shulgi's reign, the empire of the third dynasty of Ur reached its peak in terms of territorial expansion, cultural influence, and economic prosperity. Archaeologists have uncovered tens of thousands of cuneiform documents dating to his reign, many of which still have not been translated. Most of these deal with the administration of the Neo-Sumerian Empire, as well as reveal the many reforms and complex, yet seemingly effective system of government that it had. For the first decade or so of his reign, most of the documents uncovered indicate that Shulgi spent a lot of resources consolidating his rule over the northern parts of Sumer, Akkad, and even parts of Elam. A lot of this information comes to us from temple archives. While the exact course of this expansion is hard to trace, records from the temple of Ishtaran in Der indicate that by the 11th year of his reign, he was in control of this city and the valuable trade routes that passed through it specifically those that connected northeastern Mesopotamia with the resource-rich Zagros Mountains and various kingdoms of Elam. In fact, Shulgi seems to have been fixated on the lands to the east of Ur because they contained tin, copper, lapis lazuli, wood, and other valuable resources that were scarce in Mesopotamia. The areas to the east of Mesopotamia were difficult to control for several reasons. One was that this territory was under the influence of a confederation of Elamite kings, whose language and culture was different than that of Shulgi's traditional Sumerian and Akkadian-speaking subjects. In addition, Elam was the age-old traditional rival of Mesopotamian civilization, though in reality, both of them had a lot in common. Around the 20th or 21st year of his reign, records indicate a large conscription effort to seize territory in Elam and further to the east. Though the details of such campaigns are scarce, it's apparent that Shulgi was able to exert his control over large parts of Elam, including Anshan. The significance of this can't be understated, because whoever controlled Anshan essentially controlled one of the great cultural and political centers of Elam. Despite this, Shulgi knew that he couldn't hold on to these lands forever. The Elamites generally stuck together and would regroup and attempt to dislodge Shulgi's forces from the region. To maintain, as well as to expand his influence in the east, Shulgi entered into economic and marriage alliances with various Elamite states, the two most notable being the princely state of Shimashki and the distant kingdom of Marhashi. As he predicted, both Susa and especially Anshan staged rebellions from time to time. However, Shimashki and Marhashi didn't join them, and while they may or may not have sent troop reinforcements to aid Shulgi, they at least didn't support their once close Elamite allies. In fact, after one of the greater rebellions in Anshan, Shulgi rewarded and appointed the prince of Shamashki, whose name was Ibarat, 
with the lordship of Anshan in exchange for his loyalty and vassalage. From then onward, at least during Shulgi's reign, Anshan and other territories in the east remained relatively stable and profitable sources of revenue for the Neo-Sumerian Empire. The same was also true for areas west towards the Mediterranean Sea. Here though, the focus was less on obtaining natural resources and more on obtaining luxury goods from trade and tribute. According to the Sumerian literature written during his reign, it's obvious that Shulgi created a cult of personality around himself. He was viewed as a god and his palace became a temple. Part of one royal hymn describing his greatness and written in the first person goes as follows, and I quote, I am the king. From the womb, I have been a hero. I am Shulgi. From the time I was born, I have been a mighty man. I am the lion with a ferocious look born by the dragon. I am king of the four corners. I am the keeper, the shepherd of the black-headed ones. I am the noble one, the god of all the lands. The hymn goes on to show his relationship to many of the other gods and goddesses of ancient Sumer. For example, he states, and I quote, I am the one given wisdom of Enki. I am the mighty king of Nana. I am Shulgi, whose charms are revealed of Inanna. As you can see by this portrayal, Shulgi was quite a remarkable individual. The reality though, was that it was less Shulgi's divinity and more the complex, yet highly efficient bureaucratic system of government behind the empire that was in a large part responsible for his success. In fact, this system of governance had a much larger impact on the history of Mesopotamia going forward than any of his military achievements. To start off, Shulgi divided his realm into several provinces headed by an ensi, a term which in the past was used for an independent ruler of a city-state, but by his time came to mean governor. Most ensis came from the ranks of local elites close to the regime. These ensis reported to the Sakolma, who was a sort of prime minister or grand regent. In addition, there were separate leaders called Shaginas or royal deputies who ran the military affairs of each province. While they all worked together, they were responsible to the king and acted as a check on each other, making it less likely, at least in theory, that a particular city or province would rebel. I also want to point out that the position of Sukulma was later adopted by various Elamite regimes and was an extremely powerful and respected position. You can find out more about the Elamite Sukulma system in the videos on Elam. All of these individuals were supported by a large bureaucracy that helped to run the empire. One bureaucratic apparatus ran the core of the empire around Ur and Sumer, while another dealt with the periphery territories and tributaries. While complex, this bureaucracy was highly effective. Paul Alain Buliao, professor of Assyriology at the University of Toronto, describes it as such, and I quote, their complicated system of planning, budgeting, and accountability, recording the minutest details of the administration and transfer of resources, reaches at times a level of mathematical abstraction that would not pale in comparison with modern accounting techniques. This system has no parallel in the ancient Near East and confers on the Ur-3 state an exceptional place in the history of Babylonia and indeed of the ancient world. The Ur-3 bureaucratic experiment represents the culmination of a process which began with the invention of writing in the Uruk period and eventually endowed texts, including accounts, with a veracity of their own, encouraging belief in their supremacy and an over-reliance on the hegemonic intellectual authority of the scribes. Shulgi sponsored the elaboration of a planned economy whose primary objective was not economic growth and development, although such aims certainly existed at times, but the extraction and allocation of available resources in the most efficient manner. To prevent corruption, as well as ensure that everyone did their jobs well, Shulgi started a system of schools that provided special administrative training for all civil servants. Other practical innovations included a system of bookkeeping that accounted for all expenses, including those of the royal family, a system of standardized weights, and a new official calendar. He also reorganized the traditional scribal schools throughout Mesopotamia. 
Known in Sumerian as Iduba, which literally means House of the Tablet, these centers of learning produced and preserved Sumerian literary compositions and texts on an unprecedented scale. Various hymns claim that Shulgi was extremely fond of reading and recording wisdom from various texts, and in addition to Sumerian, he could read and understand Akkadian, Elamite, Amorite, and Subarian. These claims, though, are difficult to prove, but they do show Shulgi's respect for learning and, to an extent, the cosmopolitan nature of the empire. Overall, Shulgi's reign of 47 years was one of great progress and prosperity for both Sumer and most parts of Mesopotamia. However, starting during the reign of Amarsin, Shulgi's son and successor, things began to reverse for the new Sumerian Empire. It's during the reign of Amarsin that we see military conflicts go from becoming offensive to defensive in nature. We see the same thing happening during the reign of his successor, Shusin. However, it was really during the reign of Ibisin, the last Neo-Sumerian monarch, that what had been a gradual decline became the steep falling off a cliff. Ibarat, who had been crucial to keeping the various Elamite kingdoms in line, withdrew his support from Ur and instead began amassing a coalition of princes and kings under his own banner. He eventually declared his independence from Ur and captured the city of Susa, putting it firmly back in Elamite hands. Thus, the new Sumerian Empire began to lose not just territory in the east, but also the valuable tribute and resources that had once come with it. Then, there were the Amorites. These were generally tribes of Semitic-speaking people from the west, probably parts of what's today Syria and the Levant. They had been entering Mesopotamia in droves, possibly due to drought in their own lands and the better prospects that life in the east held for them. During Ibisin's reign, their numbers markedly increased. From various writings that have been uncovered, we can tell that the Sumerians despised the Amorites. One piece of Sumerian literature that was found describes them as such, and I quote, The Amorites who know no grain, the Amorites who know no house nor town, the boors of the mountains, the Amorite who digs up truffles, who does not bend his knees to cultivate the land, who eats raw meat, who has no house during his lifetime, who is not buried after his death. As the description indicates, the Amorites were a simple people. However, they must have been good warriors because as the central authority in Ur broke down, they were able to conquer large parts of western Mesopotamia and form their own mini-states and fiefdoms. By 2004 BCE, Ibisin ruled an empire in name only. In reality, his authority was limited to Ur and perhaps a few of its surrounding cities. Virtually every other place in Sumer and Akkad had either succumbed to the will of various Amorite chieftains, or their Enses, seeing that Ibisin could no longer protect them, had declared their independence from Ur to strike it out on their own. This was when the Elamite king, Kindatu, who was ruling from Susa at the time, made his move. The son of Ibarat, he advanced on Ur, sacked the city, and took Ibisin back to Elam as a prisoner. In the end, we don't know exactly what happened to Ibisin, but it's likely that he was executed. With him out of the picture, the glorious Neo-Sumerian Empire ruled by the Third Dynasty of Ur officially came to an end, and Mesopotamia once again fragmented into little petty states. The years of Neo-Sumerian rule had overall been good ones for the people of Mesopotamia in general. Many of the things that had been lost during the Dark Age of Gutian domination were revived under the regime of the Third Dynasty of Ur. Their achievements were many. In my opinion, the most important thing that they did was to create the overall political stability that eventually allowed commerce to once again flourish, literature to be written, art to be created, and order to be restored. Neo-Sumerian rule was by no means perfect. There's no doubt that many people had to suffer in order to keep the system afloat, but in comparison to the relative harshness of the Akkadian kings before them, as well as the widespread anarchy that had followed their demise, Mesopotamia under the Neo-Sumerian kings, or rather emperors, was relatively stable until the final decades of the Third Dynasty's rule. The end of the Neo-Sumerian Empire would usher in a new era in the history of Mesopotamia, one that we call the Old Babylonian Period. 
We'll talk about that in future programs. Thank you so much for joining me for this program. I really hope you learned something. And if you did, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to the channel. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Thanks again, and I'll catch you in the next one.